he's saying all can come, all can hang out with me. Jesus is shaking up the status quo. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He saw your first breath before it happened, and he knows your last breath before it ever ends. God delivers, God saves, God rescues. I think that's cool. I got chills. There was no disease. There was no disposition or depravity that can separate you from the love of God, which is yours through Christ Jesus. Amen. My Bible's going to sit here. And I, I brought a rag with me today. Uh, wipe this sweat. So you know I'm going to preach hard at you this morning. Um, I want to start off with a scripture uh, that you, you may or may not be familiar with. It's from Psalms uh, chapter 95, verse 6, and it says this, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And, and in the ancient world, this picture of, of bowing down or, or kneeling before others, it was really a common practice. It was a, a usual, a typical thing that, that you would see. Uh, you would see uh, servants bow down or kneel before their masters. You would see uh, those who were in the presence of kings take or, or, or bend their knee. And, and what it was, is it was a sign of submission to someone who had a greater authority uh, that outweighed your own uh, authority. And in a similar vein to that, it, the, the word kneel, it's, it's synonymously used in the scripture for the word worship. And it means to bend the knee. And, and the Hebrews, what they believed uh, about this idea of kneeling before God is that their knee was a source of, of strength. And so literally when they would take a knee and, and bow down before God, what they were doing is they were bowing all of their strength before the living God, and they were saying, God, all that I am, all that I have, it comes from you because you are the source of my strength. And whenever we kneel, what it does is it positions us physically where our, our hearts and our heads are supposed to be spiritually and, and emotionally. Whenever we kneel or bend our knee, it's declaring to God, saying, God, you alone are the holy God and in whatever you would have for me today and for every day for that matter I agree with it because you are bigger and badder and stronger than me whenever we whenever we kneel whenever we kneel what, what happens is that it's uncomfortable and it's inconvenient and it's sacrificial and it reduces us and, and, and church for me, there are at least two things in my life that can reduce me every time I really sit down and think about them. Number one is the love that I have for my wife and my boys. And number two is the love that the Savior has for me. And, and so this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to have a conversation, really the only conversation that Rest Church has. It's, it's part one of a two-part message of, of Jesus dies and Jesus lives. And so today we're going to sit around at the foot of the cross and look into the crucifixion of, 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 of Jesus Christ. A.W. Tozer, in similar words, he put it like this. He said, in all the history of the world, the only cross that was ever turned into an altar was the cross that Jesus Christ died on. It was a Roman cross they nailed him to, and God in his majesty and mystery, he turned it into an altar where the Lamb of God who was dying in the mystery and wonder of God was turned into the priest who offered himself. No one else was worthy an offering. And I take a guess this morning that you would be familiar with this idea or this symbology of the cross. Show us that cross, Ted. Odds are that you've seen this a million times, right? If you've ever walked into any church, pretty much, or, or driven by a church, you've seen this image, this symbol, the symbology uh, of the cross. And universally, for, for decades, the, the Christian church has used this symbol of the cross to explain our faith and explain who Jesus Christ is, to depict our image, our faith in, in Him. And so it is, it's weird and it's amazing. And, and confessionally, I, I, have, I have the struggle with it because we don't, we don't worship the cross. No, no, no. We worship Christ on the cross. But, but you cannot understand Christ apart from the cross. 
And so it's this, it's this paradoxical, it's this shocking, it's this horrifying symbol that's been used to, to tell others who Jesus is and, and our, what our faith in him actually means. And if you think about it, out of all of the options that the church could have chosen as a symbol of, of our faith, they chose the picture of the cross, they chose the symbol of the cross. And in, in, in the early church, it's believed to have started with the early church father, Tertullian, and that he used this symbol or picked this sim- the symbolism of, of the cross to describe the sum total of who Christ is and what Christ uh, came to do. But why? Why does this message about the cross, why does it matter so much? Why is there so much weight to it? Why is it uh, in churches everywhere, no matter which one really that you go to? Well, it's because our God is a holy God, and we are not. And so there has been this great separation that has happened between us and him because of our sin, because of my sin, because of your sin. And we are separated. We have been separated from God. And standing at this intersection was Jesus Christ as the only way to mediate between us and the Father. And that's why this message matters so much. It's the crux of the whole conversation for us that Jesus came and he died for our sin. We are the problem. We are not the solution. And you know, the Son of God, he came to love the world. And we murdered him. Jesus Christ came to love you and we murdered him. And when you try to wrap your brain around why Jesus came to die for you, it is such a monumental task. And and in my studying this week and in my prayer, it it has brought me to my knees and it's brought me um, in, in tears multiple, multiple times to think of what God the Son did for me. And so this morning, we're going to do something. It's going to be a little weird. I know it's going to be weird. I was telling God how weird it was, even on the way to church this morning, and I was trying to explain it to him how weird it is. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a knee before the Father this morning. And so whenever I get down to pray, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to physically, if you are able, if you are physically able and physically willing, we are going to take a knee as an act of worship this morning before God as we, as we pray. And so if you're in this room, we're all sitting down right now, but when I kneel down, I want you to kneel down also before the King who is Jesus. And, and for Church Online, you can kneel down in your living room or wherever you're at right now to join us in this. But what we're doing is we're going to take a knee and we're going to sit at the foot of the cross this morning. So... If you would, pray with me. Jesus, we, we kneel before you today, God, because you are worthy. And Father, like Moses on the mountain, your light and your life is, is too overwhelming for us to fully receive. And so, Jesus, I want to pray for those this morning who came into this place or who maybe are are with us on church online, God, and they came in and they felt guilty. Lord, maybe maybe they didn't dive deep into your word as much as usual this week, God, or or maybe they let someone down or maybe they let their selves down or, or, or whatever it is. We came in here with guilt, Lord. I pray that this morning that through the cross, Jesus, you would remind us, God, that, that there's nothing we could ever do, God, to be worthy before you. That it's not about our works. There's no good work that's good enough, God. But only the work that you've done. And so, Jesus, we appeal to your mercy this morning, God. It's, it's through Calvary, God, that we approach your throne, God, that we approach it with boldness and confidence, God. That it's by grace that we've been saved, that it's not our works. And Jesus, I, I just rebuke that shame this morning, God. And I pray, Lord, that That instead of us running away from you in guilt, God, we would instead run towards you, Father, and and, and think about what you've done for each one of us. And so, God, as a church, we just kneel down on our knees or spiritually in our heart before you this morning, God, and we just run. We are running after you this morning, Jesus. And and so, Holy Spirit, come and, and teach us today. And all of God's people said, amen. The title of uh, our conversation this morning is Death by Love. Death by Love. Um, it's, 
It's one death. It's one brutal, one gruesome death. And it was the worst and the best of all human deaths. And so we're going to find ourselves in, in Jerusalem this morning in, in the Gospel of Mark, where the Son of God will be executed. The, the God who came to love us, and, and, and we killed him in response. And so if you have your Bible, you can go with me to the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be in chapter 15. We'll, we'll go verses 21 um, through 47 this morning, the Gospel of Mark, chapter, chapter 15. And if you haven't been with us as you're flipping there, I'll catch you up quickly on, on, on what's happening or have, ha, has happened in the life of Jesus, even as uh, uh, early as the night before. See, the, the cross for Jesus, his blood, it didn't actually start on the cross, but it actually, the blood for Jesus started the night before in the garden in, in Gethsemane where Jesus literally was experiencing so much physical, um, spiritual, emotional trauma and drama that he literally was sweating drops of blood from his body, knowing the monumental task that, that set before him at, at the cross. And as Jesus was wrestling with this moment, his disciples were asleep, but Jesus could not sleep, and so therefore Jesus had a night uh, of exhaustion without any, any sleep. And over um, the course of the night, Judas Iscariot, the anti-disciple, the pretend friend of Jesus, the pretend follower of Jesus, um, brought a group of men to Jesus uh, in the nighttime to arrest him. And it was in the nighttime because it wasn't really a trial that he was going to, but it was a murder. And so the night cloaked what they were actually doing there. And, and further into the night, Jesus, he was blindfolded, and Jesus was beaten, and, and a mob of, of, of angry men mercilessly beat Jesus. And, and Jesus, as Pastor Cody talked about last week, he was scourged. And so this means that his hands would have been tied as he had been kneeled down on the ground. They would have been tied to a stone or a rock above his head as two executioners would have stood behind him with a cat of nine tails, a torture device that at the end was filled with um, metal balls in order to tenderize the meat of, of a victim's body. And it was also had glass and, and bone that would use, was used to dig into and fillet the skin of, of somebody. And so Jesus was scorched and Jesus was flogged. Outside of scripture, we know that with flogging or, or scourging, historically speaking, it's recorded that sometimes as, as people were whipped with the cat of nine tails, the, the bone and the glass would dig in so tight into their body that, that it's recorded actually that at times uh, a man's rib would be yanked from the inside of him and be flung into the crowd. That, those are the things that Jesus was experiencing the night before and all of this was uh, consistent with scripture from Isaiah 52 that says, but many were amazed when they saw him, his face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human in his appearance. One would scarcely know that he was a man. And so basically that's saying that if you knew Jesus before this moment, when you seen him after it, you would not recognize who he was because he was marred so much beyond recognition. <laughs> and so Jesus has experienced this betrayal from his friends. He's experienced a sleepless night. He's, he's been beaten. He's been flogged. He's been bloodied. He's had a crown of thorns pressed down into his school. All the time, the whole way being mocked by everyone around him. Mocking him for what he came to do. And in Mark 5, 15, 21, where we start this morning, it's, it's early in the morning. And Jesus, he has stumbled out of the praetorium. And he's been horribly beaten. And he's bloodied. And Jesus' scalp and Jesus' back, it is, it is one grotesque and oozing wound. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, that he fell. That Jesus fell in this moment. And medical experts that have looked back and examined the life of Jesus, they, they talk about this moment in terms of if, if you were in a high-speed car accident, a head-on collision with somebody else with no airbags and no seatbelt and, the, and the, uh, the, the steering wheel thrust into your chest and you needed medical help or you were going to die. They explain it as that. Some of them explain it as if it was a, a, a victim who was being murdered and stabbed in the back repeatedly. 
And so make no mistake, Jesus here is on his way to die. And he falls down. And so as he falls down, someone is drafted from the crowd to help him along. Mark 15, 21. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. Jesus was exhausted. Jesus was dehydrated. Jesus was overwhelmed. And so the scripture tells us that Simon of Cyrene, who was most likely a black man based on the region that he uh, came from, was, was uh, compelled, was drafted to help Jesus carry the crossbar because Jesus was physically overwhelmed. And I want to point out here that, that Simon carrying Jesus' crossbar, helping him along with it, it demonstrates to me, to me and you the humility of God. Humility, it's one of those, it's an attribute that God doesn't need. It's an attribute that, that no one really expects of him, but it shows us this morning in the text that if Jesus Christ needed help in carrying his burdens, how much more do you and I need help in carrying ours? Amen. Now this, this particular crossbar that Jesus was carrying, it, it's believed to, that, it, that it weighed upwards of 100 pounds. And I brought a picture to show you. Um, it's the bottom left-hand corner here, it's called the patibulum. And so Jesus would have had to carry this crossbar on the way to his cross. And this patibulum or this crossbar, it was made out of recycled timber because timber was expensive in that day. And so on the bloody back of Jesus laid a, a piece of recycled tree that had been used previously in other crucifixions and it was stacked with layers of sweat and blood and, and of, of other men who had walked down the same path before Jesus. All evil men who deserve what they got, yet Jesus has this on his back, the only innocent one. And he's walking to his death. And Jesus is forced to carry this patibulum along the Via Della Rosa. And the Via Della Rosa, it's narrow streets. This is uh, inner city. This is businesses on the side. This is kids playing kickball in the streets. And Jesus is, is, is forced to carry his cross down the Via Della Rosa. <laughs> and so imagine with me for a moment, if you were out downtown and eating at like the ax throwing place, and you were having supper with your family, and, and all of a sudden you notice out of the corner of your eye a man walking by who, had, who was completely naked and, and was bloodied from head to toe carrying a wooden crossbar. It would be horrifying. It would be shocking. Parents would be covering the eyes of their children as this was happening. And it's demonstrating to us, to show us that this was, an, this was a public act. It was intended to bring humiliation on Jesus. It was shameful in every way. And yet 30 minutes later, with, uh, with the help of Simon, Jesus arrives at the place of Golgotha, which, which was known as the place of the skull. Because Golgotha was shaped, it's a heel-shaped area that was shaped like a man's skull. Verses 23 through 25. And they offered Jesus wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it, and they crucified him. And they divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him we see in this picture of Mark 15 verse uh, 24 that the, the soldiers preparing to have Jesus crucified that the rolling dice for one of Jesus' pieces of cloth, for an article of clothing of Jesus for memorabilia to remember this day this isn't unlike a serial killer who would take an article of clothing from their murder victim and they are rolling dice to see who can remember this by grabbing some clothes of the Son of God. And they offer, the text said, Jesus, wine mixed with myrrh. Wine mixed with myrrh, it was believed to be a, a paralytic of some sort, a, a drug of some sort. And they offer this to, to people on the cross sometimes to help dampen the impact of the cross. But Jesus, in this moment, he refuses it. Because Jesus has to stay clear, he has to stay focused because he is on a mission, and that mission is that he was born to die. 
And so Jesus refuses the, the, the myrrh mixed with wine. And at 9 a.m., the text tells us nails, nails are driven through the wrists and the feet of the Son of God. This would have been five to seven inch uh, iron tapered squared spikes driven through the, the hands, which is the, the, the translation is anywhere from the, the, the palm of the hand down to the forearm. They, were, they would be driven into the Son of God and also into his feet. And so they take this carpenter who's driven many nails in his lifetime with his dad on job sites and they nail him to a tree. Jesus who created everything. Jesus who, who created this tree. They, they, they are now nailing Jesus to, to this tree. The one who created it all. By the people that he made. That he came to love. And they're killing him. And the pain that Jesus experiences in this moment, among the other moments, is, is hard to fathom. There's literally a word that they had to make up to describe the pain from the cross, and it's excruciating. Excruciating literally means from the cross. And so Jesus is going through an excruciating amount of, of physical pain in this moment. Crucifixion, it was invented by the Persians 800 years before Jesus walked the earth. And it started out as, as they would take a stake and they would run it through a man. And then they would take the man like a shish kebab and stick, stick the pole into, uh, into a hole in the ground. That's how it started. But by the time that it reached the Romans, they had perfected it. I'm sure you've heard that before. But they're the ones who brought the crossbar and the nails along to the party. And what they would do is Roman soldiers would try to figure out the most cruelest ways, the most awful ways that they could kill someone. And so they would compete with one another to see who could, who could who bring the most horror to these moments. And so they would drive these, these iron spikes through the most painful nerve centers in our bodies, our hands and our feet. And don't mistake this, the cross, okay? The cross, it was state-sponsored te uh, terror. It was state-sponsored terror because this was the government stepping in, okay? And they were saying to everyone, putting this on public display, hey, don't believe like this guy believes. Don't behave like this guy behaves because if you do, you're going to get what they're getting. And so they wanted to send a message to everyone watching in on, on what has been happening. And so in the days of Jesus, okay, you didn't talk about the cross, you didn't sing about the cross. You, did, you certainly didn't wear the cross as a pendant on your necklace or, or an ornament in your home. And, and, and culturally, we're, we're just a little removed from this. We don't, we don't understand the horror of the cross. But if we were to bring the same imagery to our day, it would not be different than, than, than having a, 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 an electric chair pendant hanging from your necklace or a syringe. That's the picture of the cross. Crucifixion was done openly and publicly and commonly. And it was intended to send a message. Historically, around 600, or, or sorry, historically in around 71 AD, uh, a man named Spartacus, he fell in battle. And on that day it's recorded outside of the scriptures that, that over 6,000 men were crucified in a single day. 6,000 men. This would have covered a, a pathway of over 120 miles. So imagine with me for a moment, if you will, if you were to get out, as we leave church today, and you were going to get in your car, and you were going to take a trip to Nashville. And for the whole way, except for maybe the last 20 minutes, it was lined up with men at eye level who were being crucified. Who were crucified in front of their mothers, and their fathers, and their brothers, and their sisters, and their friends, and their children. The cross was one of the most awful ways that anyone could die. It's a slow death by asphyxiation. And so, the people who hung on the cross, they would struggle and they would strain to breathe. And so what would happen is they would, they would push themselves up on their nail-pierced feet, 
or on their nail pierced hands so that they could get a breath to let their lungs fill with just a little bit of breath so that they could extend their life a little longer. And if the Romans were ready for them to die, what they would do is they would break their legs so they couldn't push up anymore and essentially they would just drown in their own blood. That's what the Son of God was experiencing at the cross. And I share with you the, the historical side of this so that you understand that Jesus, he became the worst of what we are for, our, for us. Moving from historical to theological, this is good news. That's why the cross is so scandalous. And it makes you wonder, like, how could the, the worst thing have happened to the best person? How could that possibly be good news? The Apostle Paul, he says it like this in 1 Corinthians 15. It's the word for. He says, I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture. This word for here, it means because of. That Christ died because of our sins. That it was our sin, but it ended up being his death. And from Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, all the way to the end of Scripture, Revelation 21, 8, the penalty for sin is the same every time. It's death. Every time, it's death. Sin happens, someone has to die. That's the payment. That's the payment for sin. And so whenever we sin, we should die. Someone has to die whenever, whenever there is sin present. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ died to take upon himself the penalty or payment of our sin. That he became the substitute. That he tagged us out and put himself in our place, in the place that we deserve. That he didn't deserve that, we deserve that. But Jesus Christ stepped in our place for our sin. And he satisfied, or he propitiated, or he took from us the, the, the wrath of God. If you belong and believe in Jesus. So don't, don't miss the, the beauty of the cross and the bloodiness of it. The cross, it doesn't reject the love of God, church. But instead it reveals it like nothing else can. And so it's on the cross that Mark shares with us some of the things that happened to Jesus, verse, verses 26 through 32. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his left, one on, or one on his right, one on his left. And then verse 28, it's actually missing, but don't get hung up there. Um, it was written... In, uh, it's believed to be written in by a scribe as a footnote commentary and added later. So, and he's quoting from the book of Isaiah, so it's still scripture. It's in the KJV, but it's not there, but don't get hung up on it. And then verse 29, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you would who destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, and he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And so as Jesus' body is lifted up and dropped into this hole, they decide to hang a poster, a banner, above his head that, that reads, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And again, culturally, me and you, we're removed from this, so we, we don't quite understand the full weight of it. But later on, it was, it was discovered um, from a second century Roman graffito. Um, there was a painting that showed up that demonstrated the disrespect and humiliation that Jesus was experiencing on the cross at this moment. And so at, at his crucifixion in the painting, it depicts the, the head of Jesus 
with a jackass on Jesus' body being crucified. And there's a man standing in the painting to Jesus' uh, right, and his arms are up, and the title, the caption underneath it, with the king of the Jews at the top, it says, Aleximenos worships his God. And so you can see the, the humiliation and the shame that surrounds Jesus on the cross. We're told also here that Jesus was placed between two thieves who in every way were completely 100% guilty for what they had done. And in between them sat the Son of God who was not guilty at all. Who had never sinned. Who lived the only perfect life. Who took the discipleship test and he's the only one that's ever got 100 on it. The Son of God sat between these two robbers or these two thieves. And, and this further illustrates to you and to me that, that Jesus Christ became a curse for us on the cross standing with the guilty. And so it shows us that Jesus paid the ultimate debt. He paid, paid the ultimate price for your debt to God. 1 Peter 1.18 says it like this. You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. And you've been ransomed with the precious blood of Christ. Like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And as Jesus Christ is crucified between these, the, these, these two thieves who are completely guilty, he has no guilt of his own. He has no shame of his own. He has no curse of his own. And so he absorbs our curse on our behalf. And so this is important because every time you sin, what happens is you occur, you accrue a debt before God. Every time you sin, you accrue a debt before Jesus Christ. And, and each month, right, you get, a, you get a, a record of your debt some way in your inbox or in your mailbox. And it, and it shows you your college loans or your water bill or your power payment or your car payment. It's a debt that you owe to someone, something you have to pay back. Well, I need you to know this before God this morning. That in heaven, there stands a file folder with your name on it. And every time you sin, it deposits into it the debt that you have to God based on your sin. Every single time. The past sin... The present sin, the future sin. And each time it deserves death. Now just think with me for a minute. Think about how significant that really is. Every sin you've ever committed in word, every evil word, every evil thought, every evil uh, motive, that sins of commission where you intentionally do what's wrong and defy God, that sins of omission where you unintentionally defy God and still sin, like this is a big bucket. And, and, and what happens is one of two things. One, you, you, you either die and you go to hell, and in hell you pay your debt. That's the first option. Because hell is a debtor's prison. Or number two, Jesus Christ, who's never sinned, who had no debt, has substituted himself on the cross, and he has paid your debt in full. Those are the only two options. The sins in your past, the sins in your present, the sins in your future. If you belong to Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, it was paid for in full by Jesus. The thieves on the cross, they stand as a literal metaphor of, of, of two people that can hear the exact same message, the exact same gospel message, and have two completely, totally different eternal outcomes based on their responses to that message. And so it stands as a warning to us that God hates sin. Further on the cross, in, in 29 through 32, they're, they're further mocking, further reviling Jesus. And they're saying to him, listen to this, they're going, hey, if you are God, why don't you just save yourself? Hey, if you are God, why don't you get off the cross? Why don't you just come off the cross right now? They say, show us just how powerful you are. That's what the people are saying before Christ. And let me ask you, if you were in that position that Jesus was in, how would you respond? How would you have responded? Because I'll be 100, 100 with you. It wouldn't have been like Jesus responded. I would have, if I were God in that moment, I would have flexed my power and my prominence over these fools. Right, that's what we want to do, right? When someone sins against us, we want to sin back against them so that we can make the, make the debt even, right? But that's not what Jesus Christ does in this moment. 
And in, in this moment, many men on the cross, they would, they would do exactly that, though. They would use this instance to, to uh, execute their revenge on the crowds uh, around them. And so many of them, would, they would urinate uh, on the people. They would spit on the people. They would cuss at the people. Also, that they could try to even, even some of the debt to level the, the playing field a little bit. Jesus, on the other hand, does none of these things. Jesus instead does what? Jesus does ministry from the cross. And he, and he speaks, he acts in a Philippians 2, 3, and 4 kind of way. Do nothing from selfish ambition or in vain conceit, but in humility consider others to be better than yourselves. Look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. That's what Jesus does. And, and he, the words that come out of his mouth from the other Gospels, it, it, it's this in Luke 23. Jesus instead says this to his father. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Why? Why does Jesus do that? Because Jesus is always more concerned with others than he is of himself. And thank God he did not answer their, their prayer on the cross and and, and use his power and his strength in that moment to come off that cross. Because if Jesus had have done that, then, then it would only be hell for us forever. There would be no forgiveness available. Thank God he stayed on the cross. Instead, Jesus, as Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed, he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. I think some of us could use a little practice in that. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. Like a sheep that's before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 33, and when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And so it's mid-afternoon in Jerusalem, and there's this eerie, this weird darkness that settles across the land. And in darkness here in this particular part of the scripture, it's a... It's, it's a representation that the light has been removed, that God's judgment has come in full force. It's a picture of God's judgment showing up. It's dark. But for Jesus, this particular darkness is, is a horror that, that he's never known, that he's never experienced before. Because more than the nails and more than the thorns and more than the, the lashings and more than the betrayal by his friends and, and everyone leaving him and all of the mocking that's happened, more than all of those things... What made Jesus sweat blood in the garden was that the Father's wrath was going to be hitting him full force. In verse 34, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at noon, this darkness falls and it covers up the land until three. And so Jesus, in this moment, he cries out to his Father. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus, he says a ton of things from the cross. The other gospels record a ton of things that Jesus says from the cross. But Mark, in particular, he zeroes in on this one thing that Jesus has to say. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And similar to as Pastor Cody said last week, whenever you cannot see the hand of God, you need to learn to trust the heart of God. And that's what Jesus has done here. He, he, Jesus cries out to his father and God closes his ears. Right? The crowd hasn't stopped jeering. Satan and demons haven't stopped taunting him. The pain has not de decreased in any way. Instead, every one of these circumstances was custom built by the justice of God. God was not removed from this situation. But, but here he does not respond to Jesus. There's no angel that shows up to strengthen him like in the garden. There's no dove that descends to let him know that the Holy Spirit is still there ministering to him. It's just silence. And so it's not just that Jesus bears some vague relationship or, 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 or semblance to sinners. No, no, no. He has become one of us. He has become the worst of what we are. In this moment. And Mark doesn't avoid it, but he doesn't really go in depth about the physical side of, of Jesus on the cross. It's much more of the mental component for Jesus uh, from Mark's perspective. 
And I think what, what Mark is trying to show us is that the physical part of the cross, that there was no Roman cross readily available that could, to, could increase the pain any more than the Father turning his face from Jesus. And so the people around, they're confused, man. They're confused. Verse 35 and 36. Some of the bystanders, they hear this. They go, he's, he's calling out to Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, and they put it on a reed to give him to drink, saying, let's see if, if Elijah comes to take him down. And they go, he's calling out to Elijah. And Jesus is totally misunderstood by the people. He's totally misunderstood by him. And, and, and those who are present, they don't want to hear Jesus pray for them. They don't want to hear Jesus minister to him. They don't want to hear Jesus love them. And so what they do in response is they, they, they try to shut him up. And they take a long stick, as the scripture says, and they put a sponge on it. And it's sopped with, with wine and vinegar, and it's shoved into his mouth. Understand this. This sponge, it was most likely part of, of a Roman field kit. And so what would happen is, is, is if you were a Roman soldier and you were deployed out in battle and you had to go to the bathroom, you would just go wherever you could go. And then what you would do is you would take your sponge that was given to you and you would dip it into the, the wine vinegar as a disinfectant and then you would clean yourself off. Church, this sponge that was shoved into the mouth of God, It was a sponge that you would use to wipe yourself with. And they demanded that he stop praying for people. And it's horrifying. The cross, it demonstrates to you and to me the incredible, overwhelming grace and love of God, but it also reveals to us the inexcusable sin of mankind. And it's with a Roman soldier's bow movement on his lips that even in his last moments, Jesus, a faithful Bible teacher to the very end, he quotes from Psalm 22 and he declares, I am the Messiah. And Jesus fully accepts God the Father turning his face away from him so that God the Father doesn't have to turn his face away from us. And Jesus is going to answer his own prayer when he says, my God, my God, why? And he's going to die, and he's going to make forgiveness possible. That's why. And so Jesus became unrighteous so that you could become righteous. One of my favorites, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says this, For our sake he, God, made him, Jesus, to become sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus cries out, my God, my God. And in that moment, he takes on his back the debt, the payment that was destined for me and, and, and for you. And in that moment, he exchanged it. He gave you, he gave me his perfection, his righteousness, his right standing, his position before God the Father. If you belong and believe in Jesus. Church, do you, do you see, do you see, you gotta see that there is absolutely nothing you could ever do on your own to be right before God. That's why, man, sinners in our day, they want us to celebrate them so much because they don't understand the possibility of God actually loving them and, and God actually forgiving them and God actually changing them. But you know this, if you're here this morning and you belong to Jesus, Jesus deposited to your account his full righteousness. He's accredited it to you. And so when God the Father looks at you, he sees you through the lens of his bloodied son. Verses 37 and 38, and Jesus uttered a loud cry with his last breath, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. So it's, it's um, shortly after 3 p.m., and, and Jesus has drank the full cup of God's wrath and love for you and me. He's borne the, the full curse. There's no debt that's left to be paid. It's finished. And God the Son dies. And now the sacrifice is completed. 
And what happens is the, the temple curtain that, that separated the, the, the holy place, it's torn from top to bottom like a piece of paper as if God is reaching down from heaven to rip open and, and the holiness explodes out of the temple and is now made available to every person, not through the sacrifice of a lamb or a dove or a goat, but through the sacrifice of, of the blessed lamb, Jesus Christ. As the only mediator between us and God. And so there's a physical picture of God ripping this curtain open. And Jesus' work is complete. And so every religion that comes along and tells you, man, and, and they say, hey, you need to do something to be right with God. I need you to know that they are liars. They are liars. Good works cannot save you. Reincarnation cannot save you. Baptism cannot save you. Mommy and daddy's faith cannot save you what particular church you go to or what particular version of the scripture you read cannot save you only Jesus Christ's work on the cross can save you and so Jesus in a loud and triumphant voice from the cross he cries out with his last breath it is finished and it's done Something needed to be done, and there's nothing that you could have done to make it right. It's all that he has done. And so, hear me on this. If you assume, if you assume that there's something that you can do to save yourself, you are no different than those who arrogantly spit in the face of Jesus because you are basically saying, hey, you know what? The cross, it wasn't enough for me. Jesus was shamed, church, so that you can be unashamed. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, says that we look to Jesus, the author, the, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, see that word, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising and shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The key to this life isn't looking inwardly to yourself, but it's to look outwardly toward the Son of God the founder, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. You need to know this, and I highlighted it for you, but Jesus, when he created you, it was a real joy for him. Jesus loving you, it's a real joy for him. Jesus coming to this planet to die for you, it was a real joy for him, yet he still despised the shame of the cross. Because that's what happens, right? Whenever we sin, shame comes. Whenever we sin, shame shows up behind it because sin is shameful. And if you have a functioning conscience this morning, you know that it's shameful. You know that whenever you sin, it is shameful. Like if you have, if you have no regret for the things that you've done or the things that you've said to people or the way that you've treated them, there is something profoundly broken in your soul. And you should be ashamed. So what do we do with shame? When sin shows up, shame shows up, what do we do with that? Well, we give it to Jesus. We give it to Jesus because shame comes where there's sin. And when Jesus takes the sin, he also takes the shame. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and, and forgave you, you are 100% forgiven. Jesus Christ, when he was shamed on the cross, he removed the shame from you. And so this morning, if you're here and you're walking in your shame and you're, you're bearing your shame, it's not helpful at all. It's not spiritual at all. Jesus Christ came to, to free you of your sin and your shame. And so I don't care what Satan has put on you. I don't care what others have put on you. I don't care what you've put on yourself. Know this morning, I am telling you that Jesus died to free you of your shame. Verses 39 and 40. When the centurion who stood facing him saw that in his way he breathed his, saw that in his, this way he breathed his last breath. And he said, truly this man was the son of God. Verse 40, there was also women looking on from a distance among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus the younger and of Joseph or Joseph and Salome. And so in verse 39, this isn't just a foot soldier here. Mm -mm. No, no, no. This is a senior ranking officer in the Roman guard. And he's taken in all that he's just watched happen. And he confesses. 
This is the Son of God. He recognizes we just killed God. And the text mentions some, some women who are there alongside uh, of watching this event, watching this all happen with Jesus. And, 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 and it mentions um, John's mom, Salome. Um, some other women are mentioned. John is mentioned in some of the other Gospels. Jesus actually commissions John before he dies to take care of his mom, Mary, because Jesus is a good son and he loves his mama and he wants her to be taken care of after he's gone. And so there's a few different women that show up, but, but one that's not specifically mentioned here, but that we see is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Jesus' mom has just watched all of this happen. And you moms, let me appeal to you for just a minute. You know, whenever your babies were born, like I, I, I know because I was, I was there with mine, you dreamed about all of the things that they might become. You thought of all of the amazing things that they might do. And you were filled with this overwhelming excitement, this overwhelming joy as they were born into this uh, world. I remember personally, I remember, I remember counting uh, Jackson and Jordan's fingers, and I remember counting their toes. But I'll tell you this, Mary, she couldn't have possibly imagined the day when her full-grown, healthy, godly, faithful, gifted son would be crucified. And I don't know that there's anything worse for a parent than being present at the death of their child. And now these ten fingers and ten toes that, that Mary once counted on her little boy, she now saw nailed to a lifeless body hanging on the cross. Then an unexpected man steps forward to take Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapping up. 41 through 47. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women that came along to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God. He took courage and he went to Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus and Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead and when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to, J to Joseph and Joseph brought a linen shroud and, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. And this, this bright irony happens on the darkest of days where men who ended up stepping forward to claim the corpse of Jesus, it, it wasn't his friends and it wasn't his family, but instead it was the religious guys that he's been fighting with. And so Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, it's this beautiful picture of grace woven into this tapestry of, of redemption. I'm not done yet, guys, so you're going to have to just hang on a second, okay? We're going to have to hang on a second. I'm not done yet. And, and that's my fault. I told him to come up at this time, but I'm not done yet. But Joseph and Nicodemus step in to take the, 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 the body of Jesus and, and Pilate is surprised. It says that he's died so quickly. It's recorded that sometimes people would hang on the cross for upwards of nine days before they died. And, and Pilate is surprised, but we know that Jesus is dead because the Gospels tell us that, that a soldier took a spear and stabbed Jesus in the side and it punctured his heart sack and so blood and water flowed. And so Jesus Christ was dead. He had died on the cross. And typically, whenever someone would die on the cross, a victim of the cross, they would hang up there on the cross because their family it wouldn't take the body down. And so vultures would pick the body from above, and, and the bones that fought, fell to the ground, dogs would chew on it below. But here in this instance, Joseph and Nick, they, they quickly step forward, and they, they take Jesus' body fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 53, 9, and they place it in a, in a borrowed tomb of a rich man. 
and the evening is falling and they don't have time to fully dress it with the ceremonial spices. And so Mary and, and Mary, they, they accompany them and they, they make sure to note the tomb's location because they're going to go back after the Sabbath and, and fully finish the preparation of the burial. And so a stone is rolled in front of the tomb and guards stand in front of it. And the Savior lies lifeless, having surrendered all he has to save us from all of our sin. And so this is good news. And it's called, Luther calls it the great exchange. Where all in once, all in one moment, the worst thing happens to the best person and it gives freedom to all who would believe. And Isaiah 53, 5 predicted it. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. For upon him was the chastisement or the punishment that brought his peace. And by his stripes, we are healed. And so church, I need you to see this morning. You and I, we are the pro-choice pilot convicting the innocent to death. I need you to see that me and you, we are the angry mob pointing our finger and pushing it in the chest of Jesus and yelling out, crucify him. We are just like our first father, Adam, who defied God in the garden. And it wasn't the nails that held Jesus on the cross, it was our sin. It was your sin, to be more specific. And man, this world we live in, it don't want to talk about sin, though. We don't want to talk about sin, right? You got all kinds of problems. You got financial problems, you got emotional problems, you got relational problems. Can I just submit to you this morning that your greatest problem isn't any of those things, but your greatest problem is your sin problem? And in fact, until you deal with your sin problem, you are ill-prepared and incapable to handle any other problem. The problem is sin. Jesus is the solution to that. But here's what happens, though. We go, you know what? I'm not that bad. I'm a good guy. You know, God's not that holy. The cross wasn't that necessary. That's what we say back to God. And let me tell you, you're not just worse than than you think you are, you are, you are way worse than you think you are. And, and on the flip side of that, God isn't just as good as you think he is. He's, he's way better than that. And so when the Bible, whenever it says from Proverbs 20, who can say I'm clean, I'm holy, I'm pure, I've kept myself without sin, the rhetorical answer to that is no one. No one has. And, and I mean, not, even non-Christians, they recognize this. There was only one who is, and we murdered him. Which proves how imperfect we are. Sin, it is both a condition and it is an action. It is something that you have been born into and it is something that you do. Sin isn't just what you do. Sin is who you are. Before you meet Christ. Because you you can't just change your behavior. He has to change your, your identity. He has to give you a new heart. It's the great exchange that has to happen. And so sin, it's this inexcusable cosmic treason before God. And it comes, it comes, hear me, hear me, don't don't drop off. Sin, it comes from this unwillingness to submit to any authority other than your own. It's the same reason that Satan and demons were kicked out of heaven. Pride. It's because of our pride. Some of you, you don't acknowledge the authority of God. You don't acknowledge the authority of God's scripture. And so you want to live autonomous life. You want to you direct the verdict over your own life is good. You want to de-God God. You want to declare your own morality. And, and, and re-identify your, in, in who God has created you to be. And all of this is rooted in... And pride, church, today we have, we have parades for things that we should have funerals for. And so I need you to hear me on this, man. Every bumper sticker that says that, it is satanic. Pride comes before the fall. 
Jesus, on the other hand, of pride, that's not who he is. He is humble. So you want a path to God, that's where you start, in humility. You bend the knee. You bend your knee in worship before God. And, and I'm saying this this morning, man, because, look, if, if all, all we stand up here and do is give you soft words, what it's going to do is it's going to create hard people. But, but if we give you hard words, we, our hope is that it would give you a soft heart toward God and toward God's people, toward other sinners, toward God's word. And so let me, I want to tell you just a couple of things that maybe you've never considered before. Maybe you've never considered this this morning. And just, and, and just hear me on that. I'm just trying to tell you the truth, man. From the scripture, from the word of God, I'm not mad at you. I'm just, I'm just up here to tell you the truth. It's your job to decide if, if you believe in the cross or not. But let me tell you this. You are, you are not a good person. This planet is not better off with you in it. You don't inherently have a good heart. The biggest enemy in your life is you. The biggest problem in your life is you and your sin. And so if you, if you want to have moral outrage over something, you should really start with the person, the picture that's on your driver's license. That's where you should start at. The scripture says in, in 1 John 1 if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. We are liars. If we say, I am a good person, I believe in God, I do a lot of good things though. Those are all lies. And so you can stop blaming your parents, you can stop blaming politicians, you can stop blaming genetics and culture and race and government and upbringing. Because at the end of the day, you are responsible for you. Jesus came, he came to save you from Satan, sin, hell, and death, and he also came to save you from you. So if you're the enemy, okay, that's where we're all at on the same, if you're the enemy, if I'm the enemy, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. We need someone outside of us to come and to save us. And, and, and so we are not evolving and getting better, man. Education isn't going to fix this problem. Economic equality is not going to fix this problem. Social justice, all of those things are good. It's not going to fix the problem because the problem is sin. And so your identity is primarily based in terms of your vertical relationship with God and not in the power dynamics between you, the horizontal relationships you have with other people. And you can quote me on that. But look, this problem is not just your problem. It is my problem. It is every problem. Uh, it is the problem for every person who has ever been born or ever will be born onto this planet. And Jesus is the only solution to that problem. And that, my friends, is the good news that Jesus Christ came on the cross and he died for our sin. He died for my sin and he died for your sin. Romans 5, 8. That God has demonstrated his own love for us through action by dying for us. And so God the Father sends God the Son to die. 